Welcome, and thanks for joining us as we spotlight members of the Jesuit community at Holy Cross. I'm Father Keith Maskowitz, Assistant Chaplain for Liturgy and Chaplain for the first year class of 2024. Today, I'm joined by my brother Jesuit, my current COVID roommate, uh, and our college president, Father Phil Burroughs. Good morning, Phil. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Keith. Excuse me. Under normal circumstances, Father Burroughs and I, we'd be sitting across from each other in some nice college locale in Ream with a camera crew or something, uh, or perhaps in the Jesuit residence. But as you all know, these are not normal circumstances. So we're taking advantage of Zoom uh, to come to you today. Father Burroughs assumed office as the 32nd president of Holy Cross in January, 2012. Over the past eight plus years, during a time of unprecedented opportunities and challenges, he has dedicated himself to ensuring that Holy Cross remains committed to the same Jesuit tradition that has enlivened the campus since its founding. Immediately before coming to Holy Cross, he, serves at, he served as Georgetown's first vice president for mission and ministry from 2003 until 2011 and he received his BA from Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, with graduate degrees from the Jesuit School of Theology in Chicago and the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Recently, Father Burroughs announced that he will step down as college president in June at the end of this academic year. However, there is still much work to be done before then. And so Phil, thanks for being with us today for this conversation. Thank you, Keith. Many people, I'm sure, and I've talked to John Gavin about this, how it was for him in the classroom, the switch in March specifically, and this semester, uh, going from kind of normal operations to pandemic and primarily online operations. Um, the past few months for many people have been a blur. Uh, how do you think the college has done? How are we doing uh, in this difficult time? What have you seen? Well, uh, as to be expected, I see a lot of exhaustion, but. Even more than that, I think what I see is a resiliency and creativity, an enormous amount of hard work. You know what, I, I think about uh, the end of the kind of halfway through the spring semester last year and people pivoting and they had one week to change all of their courses into online courses, which is not any format that we're familiar with here at Holy Cross where we so highly prize person to person education. I watched that then over the course of the summer, I watched faculty members go to you know, endless seminars and uh, training programs to help learn new methodologies of teaching. I remember at the dinner table, of the Jesuit community, so many of the men talking, for those of us who weren't in those sessions, technicalities around uh, uh, t the computers and tech, you know, in different formats and all these things. And, but what it demonstrated, I know at home, but also across our, our campus was how creatively and resiliently faculty members uh, and staff, uh, supported by incredible tech staff and educational uh, uh, tech staff, how, how they really made a commitment to improve and to uh, demonstrate that we could work in this format. It isn't ideal, but it could be immensely creative too. And I think we're actually, interestingly, learning some things for the future about how we might use technology more creatively in to support what we do in the classroom. That having been said, I think we have to look at all the people behind the scenes who work and have worked in hours and hours and continue to do so really to sustain the college. Many of them are, uh, most of them are working remotely, but we're all trying to kind of create an educational experience for our students uh, that really matches or at least hopes to match their, their needs and their expectations. It isn't the same, it is different, um, but it has been remarkable and the other piece I think I want to talk about is, is the exhaustion factor, because I do think for our students and, and for faculty, you know, this has gone on a lot longer than we ever dreamed or hoped. And it's asking an enormous amount and some uh, much more than others, even because of the inequities in our world and what families have and don't have. Uh, so what does amaze me is, is uh, the consistency of the care, both of our faculty and and student affairs for our students and all the programming and care they're doing, but, but also the work of the students themselves and their families to support them. So while it's not a reality we wanted, it's not a reality we can control. It's a reality we can contain at some points. And I, 
I do think for, for Americans particularly, this not being in control is, is uh, very, very difficult. And we're so used to many of us having either the resources or the abilities to manage our world in ways that we can't do anymore. And that's put a big strain on everyone. And you know, everybody wants something definitive and they want decisions that are clear and that they know they can count on. And there's not a whole lot we can count on right now as, as we've seen over and over again. And, and that really shakes people. Um, and we're not always our best selves in dealing with that, but I think we're all trying hard. Like I think about you know, the Second World War or, or you know, 9-11 or different uh, realities that affected our whole country and often in our, own, our whole world and how they unsettle people. And, and yet life has moved on and hopefully with hope and resiliency. Yeah, I, I, there are several things there. You said the unsung, uh, unsung heroes in some ways. I, I've been spending a lot of time with the ed tech staff. You know, they've been very helpful in the chapel where we're streaming masses. And there's a, been a lot of people who have, they're working very hard. I've, I've really been moved by yeah. people's witness and uh, commitment, you know, and that's really been across the college. Yeah. It's been nice. Part of these conversations, as we hear from different Jesuits, is to hear a little bit about them personally, as well as kind of the ministry that they're doing. Um, so I've been, you and I are living together right now because we're in this strange moment, and I've been hearing you reminiscing a lot about uh, kind of family life, and uh, I wonder if you might share that with, with our viewers, that uh, I know you were born in Vancouver in British Columbia, but you grew up in the Seattle area. Uh, would you share a little bit about growing up in the Pacific Northwest and your siblings? Sure. You know, uh, it's interesting. I had a, a, a letter from my brother who doesn't, uh, one of my brothers isn't into to, uh, computers. And he, and he writes regularly. And, and we, he, he mentioned in our letter, in his letter to me, you know, I've been thinking about mom and dad a lot lately. And this is my older brother. And I realized, and I said this to you, as we age, I do think um, we look backwards a lot. And I know that for my siblings, and I'm one of five, I'm the middle of five children, there's a 16 and a half years difference between top and bottom, so we cover a lot of space there. But I know when I'm talking to my siblings, how much as we look back on the way we were brought up and our family life and, and the gift of our parents, I just think we're so filled with gratitude. And both of my parents have been gone for a long time now, but I notice how often we talk about them as, uh, as their children. We talk about our aunts and uncles, our grandparents. When you realize that network of love and security that surrounded us and how blessed we were, I think about the selflessness that, that really that marriage and raising kids asks of two people um, and, and the security that they provide for their children. I, I think of my mom and dad and, and um, you know, my dad was an only child and my mother was the oldest of eight and how, the life they made for us and the way they loved one another. I mentioned to you the other day, I, I think the most important gift my parents gave us was the security of knowing they loved each other. And everything else was secondary to that as I look back, you know, that what you have or how much or how little or whatever, but the fact that, that you grew up in a world that was secure, we never questioned our parents' love for each other or for us. Um, well, that doesn't mean we were a perfect family. I'm not suggesting that, but it just, it, I never, I mean, you grow up in what kind of a home you have or what neighborhood you live in. A lot of that, you accept what is because that's all you know. But you also, in some way, odd way, I think, you take for granted your parents' love for you and for each other. And you should. I mean, that's, that's what kids should have. That's how I look at God, too. In a way, you, you take for granted that God loves you. And then over time, you realize how grateful you should be for that gift and what it asked of our parents and the kinds of selflessness that they. So my parents were both, uh, when they married, they were both high school teachers. Um, they had known each other from the fourth grade. My father and his parents emigrated from Scotland to Canada uh, after the First World War. And my parents um, knew each other in school and they, through high school and through university, and then they married. and. And during the Second World War, my parents married and they had my older sister first. And I realized that time was not like unlike this time where there was so much uncertainty. I realized that both my parents were born in 1918 during the pandemic and the First World War. So their uncertainty and instability of their families and movement of peoples and 
uh, war, and then my parents doing the same thing and trusting in each other and building a family in a lot of uncertainty. And then two more of us were born, my older brother and then me in Canada. And then because of, for business reasons, my, my father um, and mother moved to Seattle. Uh, my dad, at the end of the war, my dad, and, and just after that had three kids and really wanted to go on and get his doctorate. Um, and he couldn't because of financial reasons. And so dad left teaching and went into business where he also combined teaching and management and management development over time uh, as his career and did a lot in that, in that area. We moved to the United States and we moved to a, a suburb of Seattle that was um, uh, south of the city and kind of a, a sleepy community near the beach, near Puget Sound. And it was a time when the Catholic population in Seattle was very small and our parish had been a mission church that then became a parish with a full-time pastor while we were there. And then my parents wanted, and many other parents wanted a Catholic school and that was our first big project. My dad got very involved and in mother in forming that parish as we grew and my dad raised kind of in another man in the parish did five fund drives for our parish over the course of many years to build the school, the addition to the school, the new church, the convent, all these things that we did together as a parish. Um, I remember as kids, we bought desks, used desks from the public schools and a whole bunch of us, I remember kids and parents, we sanded them all down and we stained them <clears throat> to use in the classroom. That whole spirit of building a parish from the ground up, the friendships that endured, we lived in that parish for 50 years um, or so before my parents died and my, I have a brother still there. So that community shaped and formed me um, and really was a blessing. We all went to the Catholic elementary school there and four of the five of us went to Catholic high schools. Um, I don't know at one point how my parents managed, you know, at four or five tuitions on one salary um, with five kids and all the sacrifices they made. But it was a very, it was a very strong and loving environment in which to grow up uh, in the 50s. And then we got into all the excitement of the 60s. And by then we were, we were moving in, some of us were moving out of the family unit and into our lives then. But um, I, I'm most appreciative for the example of my parents, the way they lived their faith um, very deliberately with a very intellectual assessment of, as well, theologically. Uh, they went into Vatican II, kind of embraced it, and were very, very committed to all the changes of the church at that time. And that was a, for our, for us kids, for my siblings and I. I mean, I think we've all found the church to be a special home for us as a consequence of what we experienced then. You had said in passing at one point that uh, if you hadn't entered the Jesuits, you may have gone back to um, University of British Columbia, maybe, to be an architect. Uh, that there may have been a spot there for you. Um, why the Jesuits? Well, I mean, I think you entered at 18, right after high school. So why the Jesuits? Why not diocesan clergy? Why religious life at all? Well, my mom's first cousin, so he was, my mother was the oldest of a whole bunch of cousins, and my cousin Tony was the youngest, um, went into the diocesan priesthood in Vancouver. And, um, and I, as a young boy, served at his first mass. I was rushed through the altar boy practice program so that I could actually, with my older brother, serve at his first mass. It was a comedy of errors, but it was a loving one. Um, my older sister had entered the convent. I think I grew up in an environment where church and service was seen as uh, a very loving thing to do as a way of supporting the community of faith. My parents were uh, very supportive when I was expressed desire uh, in high school about the, well, about the priesthood, but it was interesting. I, I was in the late grade school and my our assistant pastor decided to take a group of us to the, the minor seminary in our, in our uh, city in Seattle. And we came home and that night at dinner, my parents asked me how it had gone. And I said, well, it, it was fascinating. I said, uh, but it's not for me. And my mother said, I'm glad because your father and I wouldn't let you go to the minor seminary anyway, you're too young. <laughs> so it was interesting then when I got into high school and I still expressed an interest and every year at my high school, you'd sign out these vocation cards. Are you interested in entering the Jesuits or whatever? Every year I'd put yes and no one ever talked to me. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, I guess that's not a go. Um, but then in my senior year in high school, uh, I who had thought about this all the time, uh, maybe not. And, um, and then I kept thinking about it. I thought, well, you know, if, 
why don't you go try it out? Because if it's not for you, you gave it, you know, a good shot and you, you went in. So um, I applied and I went in and obviously uh, 53 years later, I must've had no imagination because I stayed and, <laughs> and, it's, and it's been a good life for me. But I do think part of it comes with the respect my parents uh, had for the vocate religious life, which isn't to say they didn't want to be grandparents. They had, there were five of us, so they had hopes. <laughs> And they did get some grandkids. But um, I think it was their respect and the fact that my cousin and others came to our home on a regular basis. Uh, my parents were very supportive of our pastors and priests and of the nuns in our parish. We were very engaged. So I, I, we could see it wonderful human beings making this life commitment who were, um, and they, they weren't perfect. They were just, in general, we had really, we've had really fine pastors at our parish. Um, and we still do in my home parish. And I, I think that relationship and that reality, when you can see it up close, and the Jesuits then that I saw at high school, and their commitment both to the intellectual life, which I think was valued by my parents, but also community life, as distinct from uh, a diocesan priest. And I highly, highly respect diocesan clergy, because I don't know how, I think it's a much more challenging vocation in some ways, whereas for us, we have each other in community for that level of support. and. Um, I really was impressed by the Jesuits that I got to know in high school. Uh, and there were seven from my high school class that entered my novitiate class. Um, I'm the last one. Um, but um, it, it, I think there was a real sense of joining a community that was both intellectually committed and socially engaged. I think, and had a deep spirituality. That's probably what over time I learned was the most important factor was the sustaining spirituality of the society um, as a, as really the way that my vocation really was able to flourish because of that. Yeah. It's hard for me to believe that you are 53 years in the society. I mean, I knew you a decade ago at Georgetown and I remember thinking that you were young then and you have more hair than I do right now, which is <laughs> surely the sign of an unjust God. Um, but in your 53 years uh, as a Jesuit, this is a very broad question, but is there something that kind of sticks out, a memory, good, bad, ugly, um, that really sticks with you, uh, that, that you hold on to, that uh, is kind of present, present for you? Well, you know, I, I, I was praying about this this morning because there's so many, you know. One that, one that comes to mind uh, as a Jesuit, so I, as you know, when I worked at Georgetown, I was the Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and so I was very involved in, in that dimension of, of working particularly with faculty and administrators. And, um, I, we had a custom, Jack DeJoya, the president, lay president at, at Georgetown, the first lay president, and I went really to support and work with Jack as the first vice president for mission and ministry. And he would go every year to Rome. And when we went to Rome, you know, I always went with him and we would see officials at the Vatican and we would work with the alums in Europe and all this. It was a very uh, important trip we went every year. And the first time I went, I was, I was in a different plane than Jack, and I was with a, one of my lay colleagues. And we got to Rome, and he had been to Rome before. He was actually a former Jesuit. And we landed, and we went to our hotel, and you know, you don't want to go to bed right away because you've got jet lag and all that. He said, I think there's still time. We can go over and see the rooms of St. Ignatius. And so we dumped our bags in the hotel. We rushed over, and we got to the porter, and we're talking to the porter, and he said, uh, Oh, you just we've just closed, and um, and Tony said to him, you know, this uh, man Phil is a Jesuit. He's we literally just arrived in Rome. He's this is his first trip, and he came to see Saint Ignatius's rooms. And the porter called this elderly Jesuit brother, who no, the brother was walking by and heard the conversation, and he said, you just landed. This is your first time, and you come right here. He said, come with me. And this elderly brother took us up into Ignatius's rooms. And in that era, in that time, this was, I don't know, 20 years ago, we, he pulled out Ignatius's death mask from the sacristy. And he, he spent one hour with us. And here I am, you know, my first experience in Rome, my first experience, you know, and right into the heart of it. And it was because this elderly brother heard that I, this was my first instinct was to go there. And he wanted it to be a special experience. And so to stand in the room where, well, two things struck me. One is because later that week I celebrated mass in the room where Ignatius died, which was was a now is a little chapel, but his, and then his office. I spent a lot of time in that very nondescript little room, thinking, here's where Ignatius, you know, led the 
Organization of the Society of Jesus as an administrator. And I was really touched by the fact that his ministry was an administration, which is ultimately what my ministry has been. And Ignatius himself really wanted to go and be a missionary and do great things. And Francis Xavier really wanted to be the church figure and their role switched. And Xavier went to be the missionary and Ignatius was the administrator and the very opposite of what they tended became their ministry. And I, I think I really understood then that administration could be ministry. It's, uh, uh, and that this was a way of both revealing and finding God in all things and sharing that with others. And I, that really transformed the way I looked at my work and, and what I've done since then. Yeah. It's a good segue to ask about your present work in administration. Um, you're coming up, you'll be at what, nine and a half years when you finish? Yeah. Um, what do you know now that you didn't know before? Uh, <laughs> what, what's the view like in the, the corner office as it were? Well, one step backwards, I did serve for four years on the Holy Cross Board of Trustees before I became president. So I've had a 13 year run here, which has been really, really wonderful. Um, a funny thing, a funny story. Uh, the first, I was at Holy Cross for about a month or two and I went out and uh, uh, people, you know, you're out on campus and, and somebody asked me, Father, what are you learning as a new president? I said, and this came right out. I don't know where these things come from. So that I said three things. Well, Jesuits, we always say three things. <laughs> first, I said, people want you to make decisions before you have all the facts. Two, every day someone's coming to you asking for money. And three, someone is always actively mad at you. And, and I, I would say that, you know, those are part of the uh, part of the realities. At Holy Cross, I'd say you know, I knew Holy Cross already by its students and its faculty when I was on the board and the board members. The thing that totally has overwhelmed me, I think, consistently is the quality of the alumni community, both because of their commitment to the college, their, and, and, and not just their generosity, which is enormous, but the way it, they'll all talk about the way it transformed their lives, the values it gave them, that sense of responsibility for the world and for others. The fact that they understand that, you know, we have choices to make about how we want to live and how we want to serve. And I have an obligation to give back because of what I was given. That so permeates the Holy Cross experience. I see it in our students. I see it in our alumni. Our faculty share that with them. Our chaplains, our, our coaches. Somehow that permeates this experience. And, and I loved being at Georgetown. And I was very impressed with the quality of what happened there. It's even more intense here. Um, and so that integration of, of education and of service and of faith and spirituality and ethics um, and Division I athletics thrown on top of it. So there is something quite unique about this, the quality of a liberal arts education and how flexible it, that education is in addressing issues in the world. It's amazing how classics majors become doctors and historians become finance people and um, you know English majors become faculty members. I, I, I think you can't really predict necessarily majors with outcomes because people use and transfer the skills they have in so many ways and it's wonderful to see that creativity here. Yes it's you know neither of my parents went to college and you know, for my mother, I think especially, she th saw college as a means to an end. You get a degree in this and you work in that field. And I was a history major. Um, and then I started working in campus ministry and I think that confused her. Uh, and one of the great things about, I've noticed at Holy Cross is no one is pushing means to an end here. You know, like the, the learning is the process. Uh, yeah. It's a real gift of this place, I would say. And so many people buy into that as part of a major part of the mission. It's, uh, it's very moving to me. So the end would be, you know, how well do you live and share and engage and form and transform uh, for the sake of especially the underserved? How, how do you engage that world? And so we can do that in multiple ways. And obviously our education gives us a skill set in terms of how to ask the right questions and how to think through appropriate answers and how to live ethically and how to probe deeply for solutions and how to be committed and selfless through the long years of, of preparation for so many careers. Um, and I think underneath that, and, and I do think too, the spiritual questions we ask, the kind of our foundation in faith and 
the experience of being a community of faith. And, and while lots of folks as students and young adults have to explore and rediscover the fact that they can't really uh, ignore that they've been invited to something, they've seen something more spiritually about who they are before God and with a community that it really, you watch it unfold over time, unique to each one, um, as you and I were talking the other night, especially when people become parents and then they suddenly realize I've, I've got to think about what I'm sharing with my, my children and that changes a lot in terms of then who I want to be for them and how I want to live for them and what I need to do that well through a community of faith that shares values. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking, it's too bad you never taught a class here. You would have been a good teacher. I, I did a couple of guest, guest uh, visits, but yes, I missed, I, that was the really hard part. I loved the classroom. I, I loved, homilies give you some opportunity to do that. Um, and, but there is a, there is a given, a campaign given our huge alumni engagement. I could never figure out a way to make that work. Um, some presidents are able to teach a class, but I notice even in what some do is they just have to get a lot of help to get through a semester because of travel. And, you know, with undergrads, particularly you, if you're teaching once a week and you'd have a three hour class, you could probably pull it off. Our style favors more with the sessions during the week. And that would be really difficult for me. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, as we said before, you're stepping down uh, at the end of this academic year, at the end of June. Um, and you probably can't answer this question totally, but maybe you can talk about dreams and desires, very Ignatian language. What's next for you? What, what happens next? Sleep. <laughs> uh, you teased me earlier about my age. Oh, you know, I, I, it, age happens quickly. It sort of surprises you. You know, you, you just kind of things creep up. I, I, I'm. I'm 71 years old. I, you know, I when I was asked to become president, I was asked to uh, serve for seven to ten years, which was the length of a campaign, and uh, and I, I said yes, I can do that. But I remember jokingly saying to John Mahoney, who was the chairman of the search committee, well, maybe not jokingly. I said, John, I just can't imagine being in this job at 72. Um, well, I will finish this job a month before I turn 72, so that will. You do realize that there's a time, both the tasks that you were given and in terms of the campaign, in terms of professionalizing areas of the campus and a number of issues. It's not that we don't have a whole set of new tasks, they we do, but a lot of the things I was asked to do, we have found a way to bring some resolution to, and there's many issues that are ongoing. So it's time. And I, I, I do need a sabbatical. I'm, I'm pretty tired and um, I would like to have some time to think about, and my provincial has said, yes, you need one. And, for six months, we won't talk to you at all because you just need to unwind and then we can talk about what comes next. I, I, I like the pastoral side of priesthood and given that um, I don't, I will not carry the level of responsibility I assume that I have lately, I, that would be a, something that would be attractive to me. Um, I started out for two years in a parish. I would be happy to go back to that. I have a background in my doctorates in spirituality, retreat direction, spiritual direction, um, I have uh, done a number of work, different things in different uh, socioeconomic communities, particularly inner city communities. So there's a whole lot of things that are possible there. And as you know, I'm a Jesuit of the West Coast province. So I would assume, but not necessarily that I would be called back to the West and, and uh, which will be good for our next president. He doesn't, or she doesn't have to worry about me hovering around, uh, but an opportunity to be closer to my family again and, and uh, serve there. But we'll see, I mean, anything as a Jesuit, I've learned anything is possible. It is. <laughs> the only, to pick up on a thread from before, the only certainty is uncertainty. <laughs> well, and they always talk about death and taxes. And since we don't pay taxes, death is the other reality. And since I'm Irish, it's something you do think about. <laughs> I have one last, uh, one last question is, and it's really about kind of the present day that the past few months have really been challenging. We just came through an election that today we're taping this on Friday the 13th. That's still not, it's mostly settled, but not for all. Uh, it's been hard in our country. It's been hard on our campus. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has made things hard for the global community. Uh, and I wonder, as a campus leader, as a man of faith, uh, as a brother Jesuit, where are you finding hope uh, in these troubling times? Well, you know, it's, it's just not the last few months for us, frankly. You know, we started out this year with a tragic accident and the death of, of, of an injury to some of our most loved students. Um, the whole question for 
uh, anti-racism and racial justice and racial violence, the recession and the implications of the pandemic. Um, our whole world has been turned upside down and there've been a lot of issues we've had to deal with internal and external. I, I've said this to, in many contexts. So first of all, I don't see, I could not have sustained this job without a very uh, committed and dedicated prayer life. I, I just find the, as I, I, I knew right away, I knew when I came and watching other presidents, the day of the, the president, um, uh, I was gonna say dictator, that's not quite the right word, but the fact that someone that could have control over the whole, geez, those are long gone. The complexity of the work, the expertise that's needed. I, I work closely with a group of extraordinary uh, individuals on the executive team and faculty representatives and a whole number of other groups who, we have to work together. And I think we really have been working together uh, to engage these realities. So part of it is the how faith supports you and the understanding of, of Christ and you know that death leads to resurrection, that light overcomes darkness, the fact that there is hope, but it comes from really outside of us and the promise of God's abiding presence, and that that's grounded over and over and over again in prayer for me is critical and in the sacraments and, and the strength that you get from a community of faith. So it's it's not a it's not a solitary it's a solitary job at times because you do get up in the middle of the night often and worried about things but it's not solitary in that you carry it by yourself because that's impossible so you know innately what you need and talking to some other presidents at college I've had a couple say to me that they're quietly at their time you have a resource that I don't have and you can talk about it and I never could in in public because of the nature of your school uh, I'm envious. And I do think that hope that we have, and certainly uh, you look at the history of the college and we've been through so many ups and downs and we have survived and we've thrived even out of real suffering and, and apparent walls that we had to encounter. That does give me hope that um, everything we're facing now, and you can see strains of it, of creativity coming out or resilience or faith or people kind of understand going deeper because um, we have less distraction. So we often have to go deeper. I, I do have hope for our school, our community and, and our world, but it does ask a lot of us too. And I hope that this time also can be a time of spiritual depth for us because we're gonna need it as, as we look at a new administration, as we look at um, both on the college and in the country, as we look at the challenges we have to face globally, we are going to need people of real depth and selflessness who can make this world a better place. Yeah. You know, I was talking to a student the other day who, and you've been, you've been at daily mass and Sunday mass uh, over these, these weeks and months. And a student said it gives him a lot of, of um, he's very edified to, to know that you're praying. And he said, I wonder what he's praying about. Uh, and I said, well, he's praying for you. <laughs> I think. And he's praying for the college and, and a lot going on here. And uh, I do think that sense of, you know, faith as a, so, as a source for you, of a life-giving source. Uh, yeah. The relationship with God is, keeps you going, as it were. Yeah, well, you know, I talked a bit ago, and I can end with this. I do see administration as ministry. It's a way of serving God's people, and it's a way of finding God in God's people. And, and the encounters you have and the conversations you have here, um, and the way you watch people's talents and gifts of God being expressed, you know, we watched one of our music professors last night on in his performance of, of very complicated musical pieces, and you just see God gives us in so many ways, and and um, and celebrating that and then sharing that is critical to who we are and who we're going to become. Well, Phil, thanks for spending time with with me today, uh, giving our alumni and friends a glimpse of what it's like to be a Jesuit, the president, but not an emperor, uh, no less, here at Holy Cross. Uh, and this community, of course, is a, is a better place because you've been here and your dedication and you've been a, a very good brother to me. And uh, it's been a privilege uh, living in community with you for the, for the past few years. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, Tom Cadigan, for making all of this possible. This ends our four part series uh, about the Jesuit community. And I hope you enjoyed these conversations. For me, these were great opportunities to uh, get to know more about my brothers. Keep an eye out uh, for more programming opportunities in the coming months. And until then, be well.